the, the subject of this session is really corporate America, how corporate America has been changed by uh, the changes that we saw, the, cr the crash of the, of the financial markets in 2008, um, the changing global landscape, um, and you know, how well is corporate America uh, placed going forward uh, as we see intense competition, the rise of the emerging market uh, companies, multinationals, and so forth. How w will the American model of capitalism uh, remain the best in the world? Um, and I wanted to start with, with Roger. I mean, you, as an investment banker, when you see uh, a lot from the inside, you talk to a lot of CEOs who are thinking about their strategies, what they want to finance, how to finance themselves. What, 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 are, the, what are they thinking? Are they in good bullish mood? Are they, are, they, are they optimistic about where corporate America is going? Well, first of all, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Matthew, and it's a pleasure to be here with Tom. Uh, if we're talking about American CEOs, which I think we are, um, I think the mood is uh, cautious, uh, leaning more optimistic than not, but cautious. And the simple reason for that is demand, and that we have a um, a weak demand condition in this country, as all the data indicates. Uh, and while the direction is up, and I personally think looking ahead uh, 2014, 2015, 2016, the pace will pick up. But right now, uh, it's pretty tepid, and therefore the uh, mood, I think, is uh, is cautious. So there's, a, there's a widespread perception in a lot of quarters that American CEOs wake up in the morning and the first thing they think about is Washington. That's just not true, in my experience. And I have a fair amount of experience with Washington. It's a pretty depressing way to wake up and think every morning. Well, uh, I but, try but, never to think of Washington. <laughs> but you do run into a lot of people, especially on the coasts, who think that uh, if Washington's dysfunctional or gridlocked for the moment, then all CEOs must be uh, drowning in pessimism. No, it's not true. Most CEOs think about business issues first and foremost, and demand, investment, employment, customer issues, competition, and so forth. Um, and, and when, you know, I guess we read a lot about the, the sort of huge pile of money that many American companies are, are sitting on, um, their frustrations with the tax system, the, um, uh, the, the sort of... Uh, pressure also from, from hedge fund investors and Carl Icahn and so forth and the like to, to give the cash back to the shareholder and so forth. I mean, is that all a symptom of, of this feeling that there's nothing really to invest in or, or are there um, yeah, this lack of demand as you're talking about or is there something else going on as well? Well, you've asked at least two questions there. Yeah. Um, why is there so much liquidity on the one hand and in effect about shareholder activism on the other? Um, I think they're only tangentially related myself, but Tom may have a different view. Uh, I think there is enormous liquidity because post-2008 businesses uh, uh, very aggressively cut costs, and we can also all see the profit margins currently are, I think, at the highest level in decades. Uh, and of course, a great deal of that is converted to cash. Uh, and business investment, while fair, is not strong. Uh, and uh, especially in certain sectors like techs, the result has been giant cash positions. Uh, I don't think that's especially related to activism. I wouldn't say it's not at all, but not especially related. But the biggest trend in many, many, many years uh, at the level of shareholder issues is activism. And it's spreading very widely. It's now. Uh, permeated the largest companies there are, from Microsoft to Apple to P&G to Safeway to P, uh, others like them. And for the time being, it's very much on the rise. And uh, uh, what's happened is that a lot of traditional household name shareholders, the Fidelities, Wellingtons, Franklin Templetons of the world, in quite a few cases are siding with the activists, which impels almost every larger corporation to settle with the activists rather than risk taking, uh, duking it out, so to speak, in front of the shareholders in a vote. But anyway, activism is uh, 
is very much on the rise. It's a very profound development. I, I personally think it's a, a, a verging on going too far, but nevertheless, it's a big development. Well, we'll come back and talk about that. Tom, you, you probably are one of those CEOs who has to wake up in the morning and think about Washington at the moment, given they seem to want to stop you exercising your, executing your business strategy at the moment. Yeah, um, we've had some help from Washington. Um, I would agree with a lot of what Roger said. I mean, we've been through a period since the, uh, since the financial crisis of dramatic restructuring uh, of American companies and just a whole lot of creative uh, destruction. You think about, you know, autos and airlines and banks and telecoms, all of them really have had, uh, have had a round of restructuring, which I think in mo most ways have made these companies a lot healthier and more profitable and consequently profit margins and, and cash flow. And we're all trying to find growth. And of course, our, you know, our home market has not been growing as fast as it should. Uh, all of us believe that. Uh, but there are a lot of markets around the world where we can, we can go find some growth. And at American, we've been trying to do that. We're, obviously, we're on the tail end of restructuring, but we're very much about investing in the company. Uh, with this big aircraft deal we did a couple of years ago, we have a lot of flexibility to move our assets around because of the nature, nature of our business. So uh, we've launched a lot of new flying into Asia, a lot of new flying into Latin America, and uh, that's, that's serving, serving us well. I mean, it's interesting. The airline industry, I guess, over the years has been um, one of those industries where America has led the world, um, you know, obviously in some of the early days of flight, but then with deregulation in the, in the 70s and 80s, um, the rise of the the Southwest type sort of low cost flyer and so forth. But as uh, also as one of your predecessors, I think said, you know, if God had meant us to fly, he would have made it profitable. That's right. Um, he did say it that. hasn't really ever it made. No one's ever made money in this for, for very long, at <clears> least in this industry. I mean, we, is there a chance that that will ever come to pass? I assume it's not making money globally, really, with people like Emirates spending what they are on uh, their, their planes. Yeah, I've been around the industry long enough to be careful with this time it will be different. But I do think there are some cha big changes in the industry. You're right, the, you know, the U.S. did invent the airline industry. I happen to believe we ought to have the best airline companies in the world. That has not been the case, obviously, for the past couple of decades as we've had you know, rounds of restructurings and, and such. But we now have a situation in, in the U.S. where we have two carriers, uh, Delta and United, who have become very large and are uh, globally competitive. Um, American, you know, a half a step behind, and then U.S. Air, and, and of course Southwest, which is a mega low-cost carrier, lots of other smaller competitors. But I, I think with the American U.S. Airways merger, uh, we have the opportunity to have three big uh, U.S. airlines that are very globally competitive um, to compete against companies like, uh, you know, Emirates and Lufthansa and Singapore and the Latin carriers and now the, the Asian carriers that are growing. And I think it's important for the U.S. to have a strong and stable and, and world-leading aviation industry. And within that, though, I mean, there is this, as you're, you're encountering the Department of Justice, um, you know, we, I guess there are all sorts of still nationalistic protections here and in other airline markets. I mean, how, how far off is a real competition? Well, you know, our view is this is a hyper-competitive industry. You know, some have said it's becoming an oligopoly. Well, if it's an oligopoly, it is the most incompetent oligopoly in the history of industry because it is only now reaching sort of normal levels of profitability. Uh, so it is hyper-competitive, uh, as I described. The two, the two big U.S. carriers, American a, a third, and... Uh, and Southwest, which is an enormous carrier and a low-cost carrier, and then you've got JetBlue and, and Spirit and Allegiant and Alaska and all these other carriers. But I think it's important for us to think about this industry, as all industries in the U.S., as not being North American or U.S. industries. We're competing in a, in a, world, a world marketplace, and we need to think of it that way. And more importantly, I think our regulatory bodies need, need to think of it that way. Now, Roger, I mean, the last five years have, have seen... Um, a big increase in government's role in the key parts of the economy here. Um, and I think, I think most people would agree, most, econ most sensible economists and readers would certainly agree that uh, 
you know, much of that intervention was, was necessary at the time of crisis to, 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 to keep the economy afloat. But you know, subsequently, we've become, I think, more and more critical of some of the regulatory interventions that have taken place. Um, you know, how do you feel, how do you feel the, 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 that the government's role in the economy looks at the moment? Is it, is it too interventionist? Is it, uh, you know, as, as many business people believe? Well, you're right that the uh, uh, epic events of 2008 required uh, large-scale intervention. And for example, the, the uh, rescue, recapitalization, restructuring, and re-regulation of the banking industry has been one of the most successful uh, federal interventions ever in the private sector. We're only five years removed from the collapse of Lehman Brothers, and look at the condition of the American banking industry. Um, it's, There's all the settlements to come as well, aren't there? Which is it's, uh, it's, it's, it's by any objective measure very strong, and I don't have any dog mm, in that fight. Yeah. We're not a bank in, that, in this conventional sense of that term, and uh, I don't have any economic stake in it one way or the other. But uh, I think the banking industry has been revitalized in a remarkable way. Uh, uh, I mean, does, that because, include lend, does, does that include lending to small businesses, medium-sized businesses? Well, lending, uh, your question is a good one. Lending totals in certain respects have not fully recovered. But that, I think, is a demand-related point, not a banking condition point. I mean, consumer credit has, including cons uh, consumer loans from banks, have surpassed the pre-2008 the pre high. Business loans, as measured by CNI loans, which are reported every month by the Fed, has not yet done so. But that's more a function, as a lot of good credit analysts report, of weaker demand or sluggish demand, rather than, I think, the uh, financial condition or bottlenecks on the banking side. I just think that intervention has been astonishingly successful. Now, more broadly, the federal role in the private sector um, uh, it waxes and wanes historically. I think it. I think we're probably at a relative high point, and and you'll see it more likely wane rather than grow. Uh, and uh, you know that's a never-ending debate in this country. What's the what's the what's the happy medium right now? Obviously, the the massive debate around the country is Obamacare, hmm. and is it going to be successful or not? Is it you know is, is it the right the right? But there step is a so sense forth? also. I mean, we we have the cover story this week about the dis distorporation and this notion that being a public company is less and less attractive and uh, the, you know, even with you know, some of the Silicon Valley IPOs going on, there is a sense that many people in some traditional industries prefer to go Well, I private. love The Economist. I read it every week. In fact, Zanny out in the green room was questioning me about this week's issue already. I think I passed the test as to what's in it. However, <laughs> however, I don't agree with the premise of that. Being publicly owned is less attractive? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think you're going to go around to a lot of corporations and find them saying, we wish we weren't public and we think it's realistic that we might not have been public. Somebody could wake up in the morning and say, wouldn't it be fun to be private? Sure. And then you ask, well, is it practical that you could have, you could have been or would be now private? And the answer is no. So I don't believe that it's, uh, that, that the, the, from a corporate point of view, the appeal of public ownership is really diminished. The, the, the pass-through phenomenon, which your editorial talks about and your lead story talks about, that's, uh, uh, that's rather different. Those are all public vehicles. They're just choosing not to be, not to be C-Corps. They're choosing various MLP formats and other formats which are pass-throughs. But it's not about public versus private. They're not private. They're, the, the, the number of MLPs, for example, that are now public is at a record high, as you point out, New Richard. Yeah. So I don't think the issue is public But they're not classic versus, public companies in the way, uh, as you say. I, would, I could dispute that. I mean, mm. they're just yield vehicles. Mm. And, and uh, well, yield and, and um, pass-through vehicles. We've had REITs for decades, REITs, right? Real estate on the real estate side. We've had um, various other types of pass-through vehicles. There's nothing new about them. It's true they're more, act they're more, than, more than there ever have been, but I don't think it's a, it's a new thing, pass-throughs. Now, Tom, I mean, back to this question of whether there's too much government intervention in the economy. How, how do you feel about that? Well, I think uh, maybe a little different take on what Roger said, and I'll sort of bring it back to my little world in the airline business. 
this is a case where you know American had to go through a very difficult restructuring. Uh, have been through that. It's been uh, very successful. The company's profit margins are are the best they've ever been. That's great. Thanks to 73,000 people doing a great job. But we, um, as part of that process, created a market-based solution here in the form of the restructuring and the merger, which has created an extraordinary outcome. All of the creditors would get full recovery, um, uh, a very substantial amount of value left over for the old uh, American AMR equity holders, very unusual. Pay increases for most of our employees as part of the process, sharing the value creation from the merger. So a great solution, I think, by almost any measure, and yet the government has intervened to stop it. So I think, um, yeah, I think we need to be very cautious when thinking about government intervention in this country. And, and, and my view is, just from you know, one man's perspective, I think you know, market-based solutions tend to, t tend to work best when, when given the opportunity. Now, at the moment, you've got a, a, a mediator that's been appointed to try and stop this all ending up in court. Do you expect that to deliver any results? Well, I don't know. Um, we have said that you know, the, the, the court case is scheduled to begin on November 25th. Uh, we and our merger partner are working hard to prepare our case. We think we have a very strong case that this is not an anti-competitive merger, uh, and we're prepared to make that case. But we're also, we've also said to the Justice Department we are prepared to um, reach a settlement on uh, sensible, common-sense terms. And, so we're we're open to that. And, uh, but are you seeing I, are you seeing anything that looks common sense as you? Well, I can't really comment on that, uh, other than to say we are open. And uh, I think, you know, obviously a settlement on the right terms is better than taking something to court where the outcome is is uncertain. And in this case, given what is at stake, and the uh, potential for great value creation, good outcomes for so many constituents, we'd like to do all we can to ensure certainty. And do you think that, I mean, I mean, as you say, I mean, so many of your, your um, financial stakeholders and indeed your employees and others are supporting the merger, do you think that is being picked up in, in Washington? I mean, are, or, or is this a, a government that's quite deaf to, um, to what the market is saying? No, I think it would be hard to miss that this deal has a near universal support, and I'm, I'm sure that's been recognized, but you know, the Justice Department has a job to do, and I, I think they're trying to carry out their duties according, according mm -hmm. to the law. Um, Roger, we, we, we touched on the activism and, and, and the profound changes that, that shareholder activism is you know, threatening to bring, um, and I, I would say long overdue that, that, that shareholders really started to to, to sort of make themselves um, felt. But um, Carl Icahn, I guess the other day, was saying that you know, the green male days of, of, of shareholder uh, corporate raiders, was, was that was an 80s phenomenon. And today what we're seeing is, is very different, much more sensible, and much more about bringing contestability to ownership um, and, and, and holding management to account. What, what do you make of that? Well, at one level, uh, it, it is sensible because uh, shareholders are rebalancing the equation, so to speak, between themselves as the ultimate owners of these businesses, of course, and the boards of directors and the managements. Um, and, and, and I think it's essentially healthy. Uh, but, but one has to be uh, vigilant here because uh, uh, most of the activists manage money, and the way they measure themselves primarily is assets under management and growing that, and that ties back to performance. And uh, you know, I've seen some very, I've seen numerous healthy and reasonably well-conceived activist attacks, so to speak, and I've seen a lot which are. Uh, really just about can I pick off some quick money and get out of here uh, without particularly regard to the substance. So, you know, like most big trends, it's some good and some bad. Uh, but I think the, mo the, the key point is it's a big trend. And um, uh, two years ago, the idea that we'd be sitting here and talking about what Apple did in response to activism, the settlement Microsoft reached, uh, the impacts of P&G and the ouster and effect of its CEO, uh, 
and, and other, as I said, other comp corporations, really big ones, uh, that would have been pretty crazy. Hmm. So uh, I, I think this is going to go quite a bit further. And what is it that's made you know, the board of Apple sit up and, and take notice? Because, I mean, in a way, they, I mean, their performance has been so good over the years. That well, the activists, are, many of them, are, are very shrewd. And they know that there are certain uh, uh, resolutions they can put before shareholders for the actual vote at, at an annual meeting, which are hard for shareholders to resist. For example, the most basic of all, you know, here's a 12-person board. Wouldn't it be better if three of us, or three of our nominees, activists' nominees, went on the board to shake things up? Awful lot of shareholders would say, why not? You're not taking over the whole board, but maybe it will shake things up and produce better results. It's hard, uh, well, it's hard for uh, the incumbent, so to speak, to win a vote like that. So they tend not to contest it, as I said before. There are very few activist agendas that ultimately go to a vote. Not zero, but very few. What happens is the incumbents settle. So Microsoft, in effect, settled, putting a Value Act representative on the board, uh, changing its dividend policy, increasing its share buybacks. Uh, but it does seem an amazing, I mean, in a way, I mean, just having a couple of people that might challenge the CEO once or twice on the board meetings doesn't seem like a terribly revolutionary shift, but it seems to sort of put the fear of God into, into boards when they do get that sort of. Uh, we could have a whole separate debate about that, but you're right. I mean, <laughs> I mean the boards definitely. I'm going to ask you about this, Tom. The, board, the boards definitely don't want that. Yeah. Well, um, just again, from my corner of the world, I have 12 people on the board who are more than happy to challenge me at any juncture. So <coughs> we get lots of debate and challenge in the boardroom. So I'm not sure adding an activist. But did your, did your decision, for example, to file for bankruptcy I mean, that was kind of an early decision. I mean, the shareholders presumably weren't entirely no, that enthusiastic was about it. Clearly, that. the board's decision, but you know, this was a situation where the rest of the industry had sort of gone down this track, and American had resisted it much longer than anybody else. And um, but at the end of the day, as the other guys had restructured their costs and their balance sheet, our situation became untenable. And we made one last pitch at that, or unsuccessful, and the board said, time to restructure while the company is still, you know, still has relative health and a strong franchise, which we can rebuild around. I think that proved to be the right decision because the company is now you know, emerging strong, profitable, and, uh, and competitive. Coming back to one of the points earlier about uh, cash on the balance sheet and, and investor activism, I do think there's another issue at play here that we shouldn't overlook, and that is tax policy. U.S. tax policy that uh, discourages companies from repatriating overseas earnings. And that's the case with a lot of these tech companies. I sit on the board of a, a big tech company with a lot of cash on the balance sheet. Most of that cash is offshore cash. To bring it back is very expensive in terms of, uh, in terms of tax, U.S. taxes. And as a consequence, it, you know, it is on the balance sheet, but it is very difficult to use that for the things you traditionally might use it for, uh, buybacks and dividends and such, and I think it does attract interest. But if you were to bring it back, it probably would mostly go back to the shareholders or rather than I think in a lot of cases yeah. that's true, yeah. Let's take some questions from, from the, the audience who, I think we have a mic coming around, who would like to, to go first. Um, I'm sure there's a sea of hands. I'm staring into the, the light. Can someone, here we are, over here. If you'd say who you are, that would be great. Sure. Um, I have stand up now. Um, Cyrus and I from Fortune. I wanted to ask um, Mr. Horton a question regarding the merger. Why do you believe that American cannot emerge from bankruptcy an independent company and compete effectively with Delta and United? As you see, you have made profit last quarter. Mm -hmm. Your restructuring has done well. And you were the largest airline before these two merged. I mean, you merge already with TWA. So that's my final question. That's a, an excellent question, and I don't believe that at all. Um, I've said from the very beginning, and I believe this, our entire team and our board believes it, American will emerge, is emerging, very strong, competitive, and profitable from this restructuring, as some of our competitors did. In fact, I think going in, we even had a better franchise than many and had 
put in place this uh, enormous aircraft deal to renew our fleet, fleet and, and build uh, a, very modern, uh, a very modern airline. That's what we're doing right now. So American is emerging very successfully. But that's not really the, the, the legal standard for whether or not a merger should, should proceed. You know, successful, profitable companies merge all the time. And uh, I think in our case, American has created great momentum for the merger. U.S. Airways, likewise, is doing very well now, recording record profits. I think that builds the case for a, a, a strong merged company. But I wouldn't uh, for a minute say that American itself uh, can't be successful. We will be more successful. We will be a stronger competitor for United and Delta, a stronger competitor against all the international airlines that we, we will compete with. And I think a good, good representative of, of America as, as effectively America's flag carrier. Great, was there another question? Yeah, a lady in the middle here. Hi, I'm Caroline Chen, I'm at Bloomberg News. I was wondering, could you comment how frustrating is it to have Americans stranded in bankruptcy right now um, after such a successful restructuring? <coughs> and is there anything that you or US Airways could have done to help prevent the lawsuit and delays? Uh, frustrating, yes. Uh, it's been sort of a character building experience over the last couple of years, which I'd you know, like to bring to a close. Um, yeah, Americans is, is successful and, and you know, it's ready to emerge. Our plan of reorganization, of course, was built around the merger. So we did a lot of things at once. We did a complicated restructuring. We did a massive renewal of the fleet and the company and a merger, all sort of in the same compact window. And I think it will create a very good outcome. It is frustrating, and I think it was largely unexpected that, D that, that, that the DOJ opposed the deal, given the precedents in the industry. But we're, we are where we are, and it's incumbent on us to, number one, make a very strong case and be ready to take it to trial if need be, because we do believe in it for all the reasons I described. But number two, to be ready to make, you know, help help bring about a sensible settlement. And uh, I, think there is a, I think there is a way to do that. Um, we had, you know, some of the states had opposed the deal also, um, including our own state, the state of Texas. We made a settlement with the state of Texas and the, and the state AG no longer opposes the deal. So I think there's a way to get there and um, we're hopeful, so stay tuned. The lady in the middle there. Eileen Atman with Bell for Management. Question for Roger. Uh, you said early in your comments that CEOs don't wake up and sort of think first about Washington. Um, they do, however, think about um, cost of capital. So I'm wondering what role monetary policy and um, you know, rigged interest rates is having on corporate decision making. That's a good question. Uh, <clears throat> monetary policy, of course, is about as uh, stimulative as it possibly, possibly could be right now and has been for some time. Uh, so at the margin, monetary policy is encouraging expansion and growth um, because it's simply so cheap to borrow and therefore so cheap to, uh, uh, to expand. But that's being trumped, as it usually would be, by weak demand, and uh, uh, and it's, it'll always be the case, I believe, that uh, weak or strong demand, depending on the environment, will be more important to decision making than the but level you, of interest you, rates. But do you feel it's fundamentally? I mean, the market price of capital is just so distorted from reality at the moment that it must be leading to some misallocation. Quite a huge kind. To a degree, but I think the, 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 the main point about monetary policy so far is that it's had a lesser effect than most thought it would or hoped it would. Hmm. Um, so I think the, the big news, so to speak, in terms of the impact of monetary policy on corporate behavior is how little effect it's had rather than how big an effect it's had. And I think that's really true broadly about the economy itself. Do you share that view, Tom? Um, I think uh, 
you know, it strikes me that interest rates are unnaturally low right now. And um, in our company, we've taken advantage of that. And we've done a lot of sort of refinancing and financing and the restructuring. And as a consequence, we've put in place a lot of our financing for the future in this window. And um, so our view is that, you know, over the medium term, rates are going up. But if, if monetary policy had had a giant effect on corporate behavior, business investment wouldn't be as sluggish as it is. Corporate liquidity wouldn't be arguably as high as it is, although, of course, you could be borrowing a lot in advance of your need, but fundamentally wouldn't be as high as it is. So why so, do you think that? I mean, ultimately, I mean, why, why are these companies not taking the advantage of all this free money that's being given to them? Well, uh, of course, some are, mm. right? There's been a tr tremendous amount of astute borrowing with all kinds of corporations borrowing large amounts on a long-term fixed rate basis as they ought to because if we, were, if we sit here in five years, uh, uh, we'll look back upon this as a, 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 a very rare event, the, mm. the, 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 that level of interest rates because they're so far below historical averages and there will be a reversion to the norm. Um, but I do think it's, 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 it's the weakness in business conditions I mean, the U.S. is growing at about 2%. Europe is essentially stagnant. Hmm. Uh, there are certain parts of the emerging market world which were strong a couple of years ago. Brazil and so forth are not so strong. But even it's though, a very, you know, I mean, very, very challenging you, business environment. I see what you're doing. But I mean, you know, you take a company like Procter & Gamble, which had been pushing very heavily into the emerging markets, and, and its CEO gets ousted for being too aggressive in, in pursuing pursuing those growth opportunities. So it does seem also partly about well, the, the governance. Well, I, I don't think... I don't think the investment community would agree with that premise, Matthew. I'm not personally close to mm. B&G, but look, watching it just as a spectator, it seems to me that the CEO was more likely ousted for the bottom line results, or lack of them, than for something to do with overly aggressive expansion. Um, there was a lot of disaffection, it seems to me, again, I was just a spectator, mm. over the, what the company's results were rather than what the company's uh, mm. you know, emerging market commitments might have been. Uh, which is a sign of the times in terms of the tenure of chief executives in the United States. And one of the other things we could obviously talk about is incre increasingly it's a short-term job. Well, on that note, unfortunately, it's a short-term panel as well. So it's, um, our time is, is already up. Um, thank you both, Roger and Tom, for, having a, uh, for being such a, a stimulating panel. And uh, this conversation could certainly go on a lot longer. Thank, thank you. you very much.